Let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, Jessica Cooperman is an Associate Professor of Religion Studies and Director of Jewish Studies at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on 20th century American Judaism and on connections between American religion and state policy. Her book, Making Judaism Safe for America, World War I and the Origins of Religious Pluralism, was published in 2018 and received an honorable mention for the Saul Wiener Prize in American Jewish History. Her current research explores projects for promoting Jewish-Christian dialogue and understanding after World War II. Before I leave the stage to Jessica, I would like to remind a few maintenance, maintenance things. Please make sure that all your microphones and cameras are turned off in order to avoid any feedback and technical issues. I will, as a host, take a liberty and will stop your videos if any of you by accident uh, turn it on. Uh, so please just be aware of that. You are welcome to write down your questions for the Q&A portion of the talk. Please use the chat function to do so. Our program is recorded and will be available via the center's YouTube channel. And now, without further ado, Jessica Kuferman. Hi, thanks everybody. Um, thanks very much to Mago and to the Center for Jewish History uh, for hosting this event and for keeping their amazing series of events going under uh, what I'm sure are more trying than usual circumstances. Um, and thank you to both the Center for Jewish History and to Fordham University for supporting uh, my research on this new project. I really appreciate it. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was at an event for the Institute for Jewish Christian Understanding at Muhlenberg College, a Lutheran affiliated liberal arts college where I teach. A minister involved with the Institute struck up a conversation with me about the Passover Seder he had recently led at his church. He was particularly pleased with it that year, he explained, because the assistance of a local rabbi had helped him create a truly authentic Seder experience for his congregation. We chatted pleasantly, but the conversation left me feeling surprised. Why was this minister leading a Passover Seder at his church? After grilling friends, colleagues, and other local clergy, I was startled to learn of the extent to which Christian celebrations of Passover are both common and widespread, and frankly embarrassed to admit that I knew nothing about them. I am certainly no expert on contemporary Christian rituals, but I do have some expertise in the study of American Jews, and it seems strange to think that this paradigmatic Jewish ritual, the one which according to the 2014 Pew Research Center study, is observed more frequently than any other Jewish religious ritual, the one celebrated by 70% of all American Jews, including those who do not identify with Judaism as a religion, had become a Christian practice, and I hadn't even heard of it. I recognize that my ignorance is not a particularly remarkable data point, but the minister was clear that his decision to celebrate the Passover Seder had emerged from his commitment to interfaith work and building connections between Christians and Jews. We were both involved with the Institute for Jewish Christian Understanding. We were chatting at one of its events. The Institute's offices are next door to mine, and I still had no idea that this practice existed. What's more, when I checked with the rabbi to clarify the story, he confirmed that the minister had reached out to him with some questions, but took care to tell me that he had no idea why Christians would celebrate a Passover Seder. For the minister, the rabbi's involvement had seemed crucial. It made the Seder authentic and imbued it with the spirit of interfaith worship. The rabbi, on the other hand, was careful to put a good deal of distance between himself and this ritual, which he claimed to know very little about. This reaction stood in stark contrast to that of another rabbi I spoke to, who, unlike his colleague, had traveled to churches across the country and helped to lead many Christian Seders. He was far more familiar with the phenomenon and saw helping to lead such Seders as part of his professional responsibility but did not argue that his participation made these satyrs more authentic. Instead, he saw these invitations to participate in Christian satyrs as an opportunity to serve as a friendly Jewish face in spaces where people might not have encountered many Jews. His goal, he explained, was to help Christians learn to hate us a bit less. 
I proceeded to bother friends and acquaintances with questions about Christian celebrations of Passover, and while this was hardly a scientific study, it was interesting to note that while most of my, the Jewish identifying people I spoke to seem not to have heard very much about them, my yeshiva-educated sister-in-law still thinks I'm making this up, um, many Christian identifying friends had either attended or chosen not to attend church-based seders. Most striking to me was the reaction of one of my daughter's teachers, a person in their 30s who grew up attending Catholic schools. They argued that Passover was an uncomplicated part of the Christian tradition. Jesus was a Jew, Jews celebrated Passover, therefore Christians celebrate Passover, and as far as they knew, Christians had always done so. The differences in these reactions and responses fascinated me. What did it mean for Christians to celebrate Passover? When did this practice become common? And in what ways are these celebrations connected to Jews or Judaism, if at all? What, moreover, might different forms of engagement with the holiday of Passover help us notice about Jewish-Christian interfaith relations in the modern United States? My project over the past several months has been to learn about Christian celebrations of Passover and its rituals. And I have to admit, it's been harder to track than I expected. And ultimately, I'm not at all sure that a scholar of American Jews possesses the expertise needed to do justice to the topic, but I'm very happy to share what I've learned so far. First, while the Synoptic Gospels portray Jesus' Last Supper as a Passover Seder, it seems unlikely, at least to me as a non-expert, that the Seder itself has enjoyed long embrace by Christian communities. Even if we look back only as far as the early modern period, European Christian engagement with Passover rituals seems more characterized by suspicion than by any sense of shared religious commitment. Yaakov Deutsch, in his study of early modern ethnographic descriptions of Jews and Judaism, notes that while the early modern period witnessed an uptick in Christian interest in Jewish rituals, the goal of this new scholarship was largely to demonstrate the superiority of Christianity over Judaism. So while Passover received significant attention in the ethnographic works of the time, Deutsch notes that analyses often emphasize the absurdity of Jewish beliefs and rituals, the gluttony and ignorance exhibited at holiday meals, or the outright threat to Christians posed by Jewish practices, expressed perhaps most famously in stories dating back to the Middle Ages of Jews murdering Christian children in order to use their blood as part of the preparation for the Seder, and some of you may have had the opportunity to hear Magda Tito speak about this last week. Even the historical validity of the Synoptic Gospels claim that the Last Supper was a Seder is something that scholars have debated over the years. There's a vast body of literature discussing the intertwined histories of Easter and Passover, and some of you may be far more expert in these debates than I am but I was fascinated by how we can track them over time as arguments in this scholarship about the historical relationship between Judaism and Christianity shifted in light of changing attitudes towards interfaith engagement. For example, historian Israel Yuval explains that in 1925, when the New Testament scholar Robert Eisler published an article in an academic journal comparing the Passover Afikomen and the Christian host, the journal's editor Hans Lietzman was so scandalized by the comparison of Jewish and Christian rituals that he demanded that the second part of the article be retracted. When forced by Eisler's lawyer to let the article run, Lietzman, an expert on the Last Supper, conceded but inserted a note to readers explaining that he was being forced to publish in spite of the fact that the article did not meet the scholarly standards of the journal. By 1955, however, scholarly consensus around the relationship between Passover and Christian ritual had clearly shifted. In a review essay in Theology Today, Professor Christer Stendel of Harvard Divinity School argued that while one of the, quote, most influential books in the study of the modern Eucharist is Mass and the Lord's Supper by Hans Lietzmann, who had battled against the attempt to connect Passover with Christian practices, a newly translated book, The Eucharistic Works of Jesus, by a scholar named Joachim Jeremias, was attempting to prove against Lietzmann that the Last Supper was, in fact, a Passover stater. Sendal's review notes that Lietzman and his colleagues had for many years represented the dominant scholarly consensus, and they had, he had some skepticism about Jeremiah's revolutionary claims, but describes the book as both startling and refreshing. By 1966, however, the tide of this debate had completely turned. In a review of the latest English translation of Jeremiah's book, 
J. McHugh, writing in New Blackfriars, noted that when the book first appeared in German in 1935, quote, the severance of the Last Supper from the Passover was by the vast majority accepted as so axiomatic that argument in a contrary sense was regarded as almost freakish, but that Jeremiah's deeply serious work had proven such a position to be false, demonstrating that even in the fourth gospel of John, there are many traces of a tradition according to which the Last Supper was a Passover meal. Shifts in scholarly consensus are not at all unheard of, but this one does seem to bolster my suspicion that Christian celebrations of Passover have not always been the norm. Professor of Comparative Theology, Marian Moyard, agrees with me. In her study of Catholic celebrations of Passover, she argues that, quote, until recently the dominant theological discourse was one of highlighting the discontinuity between Jewish and Christian traditions. Only following the Declaration Nostra Aetate by the Second Vatican Council in 1965, she argues, did Catholics rediscover the Jewishness of Jesus and begin to view Jewish rituals like the Passover Seder as part of their own Christian heritage. The year in which Jeremiah's book was reissued, 1966, and the seemingly radical shift in scholarly consensus that it represented, reminds us that these academic debates did not take place in a vacuum. The 1960s were times of profound change in the Christian world and in the history of Jewish-Christian relations. Historian of American religion, K. Helan Gaston, notes that as late as the 1950s, American Catholic leaders shied away from even using the term Judeo-Christian for fear that it would suggest that Judaism and Catholicism shared a common theological denominator. The embrace by both Catholics and Protestants of what had historically been a suspicious Jewish ritual implies a significant change in thinking and not just among academics. Moyer's claim that we should consider Nostra Aetate, the Catholic Church's declaration on its relationship to non-Christian religions as a turning point makes a good deal of sense. In this declaration, the Vatican sought to reconfigure the church's attitude towards Jews, declaring, and I'll give a lengthy quote, as the sacred synod searches into the mystery of the church, it remembers the bond that spiritually ties the people of the new covenant to Abraham's stock. She professes that all who believe in Christ Abraham's sons, according to faith, are included in the same patriarch's call, and likewise that the salvation of the church is mysteriously foreshadowed by the chosen people's exodus from the land of bondage. The church, therefore, cannot forget that she received the revelation of the Old Testament through the people with whom God in his inexpressible mercy concluded the ancient covenant. Since the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is thus so great, this sacred synod wants to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit above all of biblical and theological studies, as well as of fraternal dialogues. Following this statement, the idea that a Passover Seder, a ritual once seen as demonstrating Jewish deviance and ignorance, could be embraced and celebrated by Christians becomes more comprehensible. As scholars reconsider Jesus' historical identity as a Jew, Nostra Aetate recast Judaism itself as part of a shared spiritual patrimony relevant to both Jews and Christians. The paradigmatic Jewish holiday of Passover, commemorating the Jewish exodus from Egypt and transformation into a cohesive national community, could now be celebrated as part of the foreshadowing of the salvation of the church and as a site for mutual understanding. The Catholic Church, moreover, was not alone in its efforts to rethink the relationship between Christians and Jews in the mid-60s. In May 1964, the Lutheran World Federation renounced anti-Semitism as, quote, an estrangement of man from his fellow men, declaring that anti-Semitism is, quote, a denial of the image of God in the Jews. It represents a demonic form of rebellion against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and a rejection of Jesus the Jew. In June of that same year, the General Board of the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the United States proclaimed that, quote, the spiritual heritage of Jews and Christians should draw us together in obedience to the one Father and in continuing dialogue, and urged, quote, the members of its constituent communions to seek that true dialogue with the religious bodies of the Jewish community through which differences in faith can be explored within the mutual life 
of the family of God, separated but seeking from God the gift of renewed unity. By the summer of 1967, the World Council of Churches declared that, quote, encounter with Jews is essential. Ongoing encounter with Jews can mean a real enrichment of our faith. Christians should therefore be alert to every such possibility, both in the field of social cooperation and especially on the deeper level of theological discussion. Taken together, these different statements certainly confirm the importance of the 1960s as a moment of change, but I would note that they argue for two related but not identical types of change. The first concerns the possibility that through meaningful engagement with what we might call Judaism, Bible, theology, spiritual heritage, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Christians might deepen their own faith and their understanding of Jesus the Jew. The other concerns engagement with Jewish people who might serve on the one hand as a conduit to that understanding and who additionally should no longer face anti-Semitism from Christians as anti-Jewish sentiment is itself a rejection of Jesus the Jew and of God's saving design. It's easy to see where these concerns overlap. By engaging reverently with the texts and practices of a group of people, one might come to respect them, and by engaging respectfully with a group of people, one might themselves be enriched. But there are also ways that these goals can be separated, such that one could wish to engage with Judaism in the hope of deepening a connection to Christianity without necessarily having much to do with Jews, or one could hope to fight off anti-Semitism without much engagement with Christianity. These possibilities seem important to consider when thinking about the impact of these shifts in church policies and in Jewish-Christian relations, as well as in considering the new engagements with Passover Seder that emerged in the late 20th century. While the fraught history of medieval and early modern Jewish Christian encounters during the Passover Eve season may offer us reasons to think of the Seder as an unlikely site for improving interfaith relations, the structure of the Jewish Seder actually makes it a good starting point for experimenting with a new ritual. Unlike many holidays, the Seder is generally celebrated at home and led traditionally by a male family member. One does not need special expertise or clergy status to lead the ritual, nor must one attend religious services in a synagogue in order to celebrate the Seder. Perhaps even more importantly, the Seder comes with its own instruction manual, the Passover Haggadah, which tells the Passover story and explains how the ritual should be observed. So while the history may be fraught, the Seder is actually quite user-friendly particularly in the 20th and 21st century United States, where one can easily find English translations of the text that allow anyone, regardless of education or background, to make the Seder their own. The earliest example I found of a Passover Haggadah intended specifically for use in Christian settings was actually published by the Jewish Anti-Defamation League in 1954. The ADL was founded in 1913 as an advocacy group, advocacy group with the mission of combating anti-Semitism. The Haggadah was originally printed in the March edition of the Christian Friends Bulletin, an ADL newsletter intended for outreach to Christians. It was then reprinted as a standalone publication simply called Passover Haggadah. The introductory paragraph claims that even at this early date, Passover had become a significant event in Christian communities, declaring that, quote, the Passover celebration is now demonstrated in many church schools and congregations throughout the land and is happily another indication of the growing awareness on the part of Jews of the meaning and observances of Christianity and on the part of Christians of the meaning and observances of Judaism. The authors offer their hope that the increased knowledge of the Seder ritual will, quote, help in some small measure to fulfill a further realization of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. It's hard to verify the text claim that demonstrations of the Seder had already become a widespread practice by the early 1950s. It is certainly possible that Christian communities hosted Seder demonstrations, perhaps led by local rabbis employing a Haggadah text intended for use in Jewish homes, and that this new text was meant as a tool to help formalize existing Christian practices. Although it also seems possible that this text, which does not differ significantly from other English language Haggadot, was printed and distributed in order to help shape a new Christian understanding of this once mysterious and suspicious Jewish ritual. 
Like many other 20th century non-Orthodox American adaptations, this Haggadah omits the, omits the traditional Hebrew text request that God should pour out his wrath against the heathens who will not acknowledge you and who have consumed Jacob and ruined his home. Rather than asking God to pursue them in rage and destroy them from under the heavens of the eternal, it instead hopes that, quote, he who broke Pharaoh's yoke forever will shatter all fetters of oppression and hasten the day when sword shall at last be broken and wars ended so that mankind freed from violence and from wrong and united in an eternal covenant of brotherhood may celebrate the universal Passover in the name of our God of freedom. It's a prayer that makes sense in the context of post-war America, with its focus both backwards to the end of the terrible violence of World War II and ahead to the growing civil rights movement. It also clearly seeks to shake off historical perceptions of Jews as thre a threat to their Christian neighbors, and instead to put forward a vision of Jews as engaged alongside their neighbors in a shared celebration of freedom. When thinking back to the goal set out in Nostra Aetate and in Protestant statements issued around the same time, however, it seems clear that this Haggadah is interested in using the Seder as a tool to diminish prejudice and anti-Jewish sentiment, a goal which is certainly in keeping with the founding mission of the ADL. But it's worth noting that the text has little obvious interest in using the Seder as a means to help Christian observers relate to Jesus the Jew, nor does it purport to offer Christians a way to make this ritual their own. It's intended for educational purposes, and the education it offers is largely about making this Jewish ritual comprehensible and non-threatening in post-war America. This educational model of the Haggadah uses the Seder as a tool for promoting mutual respect and interfaith understanding, but it's generally careful to mark the difference between Jewish and Christian traditions. A post Nostra Aetate example is Rabbi Balfour Brickner's 1969 Interreligious Guide to Passover and Easter. Brickner, the founder and director of the Reform Movement's Commission on Interreligious Affairs and co director of its Commission on Social Action, opened his text by explaining first and foremost that his booklet was a guide, not an actual Haggadah, and that it was not intended for use at a, at a Seder. The guide he informed his readers required the participation of both a rabbi and a minister to lead the lessons and should be used only for study. Brickner wanted his audience to engage in a detailed exploration of Jewish and Christian practices in order to make them better partners in American life, but he was committed to emphasizing the boundaries of difference between the two holidays. In his introduction, Brickner explains, quote, the interreligious openness which characterizes much of America's current religious life brings Jews and Christians together on an increasingly complex level. When we share common social values, we seek to intensify our cooperative actions in the community. Working together towards the solution of common social problems stimulates the desire jointly to study one another's belief and religious practices, the better to understand our differences as well as our similarities. No two holidays offer a finer opportunity for interreligious study than Passover and Easter. For while Easter has its roots in Passover, it is obviously different from it. A study of the difference can help Christians and Jews better understand some of the basic ideas which distinguish them from each other. Brickner's guide offered a comparative lesson on the historical and ritual similarities, but also the crucial differences between Easter and Passover. And this focus on appreciation of difference informed other interfaith guides to Passover as well. Rabbi Leon Klinicki, who served as interfaith director of the Anti-Defamation League, um, participated in the writing of an updated Passover Haggadah, published jointly by the ADL and the Liturgy Training Program of the Archdiocese of Chicago in 1985. In his introduction, Klinicki tells his reader that the Seder explains the essentials of Judaism, which he described as election by God, solidarity with the poor, history, heritage, and the actuality of oppression. Klinicki then chronicles a history of Jewish oppression, stretching from Egypt to blood libel accusations to Nazi concentration camps and ghettos. He dwells on these tragedies of Jewish history, presumably in order to help his non-Jewish readers better understand the meaning of the Seder, 
the significance of which, he argues, lies in the hope it brought to Jews in moments of suffering, quote, in concentration camps, living in ghettos, hiding under friendly roofs or in the forest, it brought hope to Anne Frank and her family. Klinicki's Seder story is directly tied to Jewish history and particularly to legacies of anti-Semitism. It reaches across religious boundaries in order to help Christians appreciate the values, the pain, and the distinctiveness of Jewish experience. It's an approach to interfaith work that focuses on reducing Christian prejudice towards Jews, not on the religious experience of Christians. Perhaps not surprisingly, however, Rabbi Klinicki's Catholic partner describes the Passover Seder in different terms. Gabe Huck of the Archdiocese of Chicago introduces the Seder by explaining, quote, for a generation now, great numbers of Christians have been learning about the Jewish festival of Passover and especially about its special ritual, the Seder meal. In large and small groups, Christians have begun to celebrate the Seder meal. The motivation for this has been various, but the experience has led many to the same conclusion. We do not come to the Seder as a history lesson or to a restaging of the Last Supper of Jesus. We come to the Seder to acknowledge common biblical roots. Eventually, we will find that we belong here at Passover, around this table, telling this story. But what story? Klinicki's story seems more akin to the one told to me by the rabbi who explained that by participating in Christian Passover Seders, he could perhaps reduce hatred directed against Jews. The story that Huck tells represents a different model, one that acknowledges the educational strategy of his Jewish partner, but also seeks to make a place for Christians to find their own sense of belonging at the Seder table. The two stories are related and both reflected in those 1960s church statements, but they are not the same. And as Christian Seders developed, they often moved away from attempts to educate Christians about anti-Semitism and Jewish distinctiveness, and instead reflected new social, scholarly, and theological claims about Christian investments in Judaism as part of their own religious heritage. This does not mean that the educational model of the Haggadah disappeared, but it faced competition from interpretations that focused less on the Seder as a path to understanding one Jewish, one's Jewish neighbors and more as a ritual for Christians to help them better understand their own religious identity and their relationship to Jesus, the only Jew really required for a Christian Seder. In the Passover meal, a ritual for Christian homes published in 1972, Arlene Hines opens her text with an extended quote from the Catholic Church's 1969 working document on Jewish Christian relations as a way of framing the purpose of her work and the relationship between the holidays, stating quote, at this time, Christians and Jews celebrate their own feasts in their own ways. And we can see in these celebrations of Easter and Passover, the common bond of the symbolism of the Exodus. Jesus was a Jew, and today we wish to draw upon the traditional Jewish Seder and the words of the New Testament to help us more fully appreciate Jesus's observance of his Jewish heritage. Why do we eat bitter herbs tonight at this special meal, she asks. The Jews of old ate bitter herbs on Passover night, as do the Jews today, because our fathers were slaves in Egypt and their lives were made bitter. We who are followers of Christ do not hesitate to taste of this bitterness as a reminder of his passion and death. Heinz depicts three groups of people present at the Seder, the Jews of Christ's time, the Jews of today, and the Christians of today, all of whom have different but equal places at the table. In other models, however, the Jews of today are increasingly pushed to the side or rendered unnecessary to the ritual. Sometimes, as in James Emerson's A Christian Seder from 1976, the Haggadah opens with stories about Jewish friends and the charming folk customs he observed at their Seder tables, like opening the door for Elijah in the hope that a young man might be there to marry an eligible daughter. But the text proceeds without distinguishing between ancient Hebrews, modern Jews, and Christians, so that when we went forth from Egypt, we are the Christian participants at the Seder who read passages from the Reform Movement's Union Haggadah interspersed with readings from the Gospels. Or in Sam McIntosh's A Passover Seder for Christian Families from 1986, 
in which he thanks Jewish consultants in the acknowledgments, but assures his readers that the Seder is his to pass on without the need for rabbinic or Jewish guidance or approval, proclaiming, the Passover Seder is a festive meal begun at sunset on the evening of the full moon in early spring. During the meal, we retell the story of the exodus from Egypt as we eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread. This booklet contains the text of the seders my wife Anne and I celebrated with our family and friends. One place that modern day Jews sometimes remain visible in these Haggadah texts is in the food served at the meal. Almost all Christian Haggadot, as well as some Jewish ones, offer instructions not just on how to perform the ritual, but also on how to clean and decorate the home, set the table, and prepare symbolic foods. Many, however, also include recipes describing appropriate meals for the occasion. In a Passover ritual and menu for observance by Christians from 1984, the author who identifies herself as a Jewish convert to Christianity offers detailed menu suggestions, quote, no flour, no ham, no pork, no dairy, only kosher oil. For appetizers, she suggests, quote, chicken soup with matzo balls or small kosher egg noodles, vegetable broth, borscht, served hot or cold, and gefilte fish, as well as hard-boiled eggs dipped in salt water. For the entree, she recommends that all meat and poultry be labeled kosher. Chicken can be fried in a mix of matzo meal and seasonings, but brisket of beef or roast lamb are also recommended. In these menus, the selection and preparation of mid-20th century Ashkenazi Jewish foods seems intended as a way of lending the Seder an air of Jewish authenticity, while keeping the text and ritual focused on the Jewishness of Jesus rather than on modern-day Jews. But even this culinary connection to contemporary Jews or Jewish culture is optional. For example, a Presbyterian Haggadah from 1970 assures its readers that, quote, the Seder is an opportunity for transcending differences among separated brethren, Christian and Jewish, Catholic and Protestant, but also reassures them that these differences will be fully transcended with the ultimate and universal acceptance of Christ. Quote, the Seder has significance also for all mankind. The Pharaoh of the Exodus is symbolic of the tyrants of our day, as well as the tyrants of every era in history. In Jesus Christ, who is our Passover, this freedom from tyranny is passed on to all men. By the power of his life, death, and resurrection, all men are made free. The freedom given to Israel by Yahweh becomes the freedom of the new Israel, the church. It is then a freedom offered to the whole world through Jesus Christ. In this model of Christian Haggadot, Jews, Judaism, and Jewish interpretations of the Passover story disappear entirely, and so interestingly do Jewish food traditions. Sam McIntosh as a Passover Seder for Christian families offers very detailed descriptions of how to prepare for the Seder, and he includes a recipe for roasted leg of lamb. The recipe had nine pounds of lamb, garlic, oregano, salt, pepper, lemon juice, onions, a pound and a half of orzo pasta, a cup of dry red wine, two cups of tomato puree, and a cup of grated Parmesan cheese. The recipe is interesting for its deviation from virtually all Jewish dietary restrictions. Milk and meat are combined, and pasta, which is forbidden during Passover, is included. The choice of menu could simply reflect a lack of understanding of Jewish dietary law, but it seems more likely, at least to me, that it reflects a lack of interest. His Seder is, after all, for Christian families who have no religious obligation to engage with Jewish Seder rituals. Jews and their practices are erased from the text, and the Jewish Seder is superseded by a Christian Seder, much as traditional Christian teachings describe Judaism itself as superseded by the coming of Christ. In the Food and Feasts of Jesus, the original Mediterranean diet with menus and recipes by Douglas Neal and Joel Pugh, published by Roman Littlefield in 2014 and advertised as a cookbook. The authors offer menus and recipes intended to allow readers to eat the foods that Jesus would have enjoyed, as well as detailed descriptions of how he would have celebrated the festivals of his time. In the two chapters dedicated to Passover, the authors attempt to transport readers back to the Jerusalem of Jesus's day. The city they report would have been festive, containing, quote, elements of the 4th of July, Thanksgiving dinner, and a road trip with friends and family. 
Wealthy Jews, they explained, often kept second homes in Jerusalem in order to be able to stay comfortably during the holidays, but Christian Jews carried tents and stayed modestly in neighboring communities. The streets of the city they described were dangerous, filled with pickpockets, thieves, unscrupulous merchants, zealots, and revolutionaries, but the Jews were committed to celebrating. The authors explain, quote, a law in the book of Deuteronomy required that Jews set aside a tithe of their har harvest for a celebration. Can you imagine a modern law requiring that we use a certain percentage of our income for vacations and peace? Apparently, most Jews took this seriously. Not only did they eat and drink much more than usual, but they used the feast as an opportunity to buy special clothing, luxury items, and household wares to take home with them. Some pilgrims gave money to caterers, who then prepared their meals for the rest of their stay in Jerusalem. The text almost seems like a throwback to early modern descriptions of Passover, in which the Jewish ritual presents potential dangers to the Christian pilgrim and emphasize the gluttony and materialism of Jews in contrast to the sincere and humble Passover of Jesus and his followers. The Jew Jews of today do not appear in the text at all, except perhaps through a recipe. While Jewish dietary law specifies that the baking of Passover matzah must be entirely completed within 18 minutes, lest the flour and water mixture have any time to rise, Neil and Pugh instruct their readers that in order to make matzah as Jesus would have eaten it, one should knead their dough thoroughly and then let it rise for at least 30 minutes before rolling it flat and baking. The suggestion here seems to be that the matzah modern Jews eat for their Seder is not truly authentic. Indeed, the authors trace the many changes to the Jewish Haggadah that have taken place over the centuries. Only the modern Christian Seder, they seem to imply, based on their imagined depiction of the life and times of Jesus, can connect its participants back to the true meaning of Passover. So what can these different approaches to the Seder tell us about interfaith dialogue and the efforts at reconfiguring the relationship between Jews and Christians that came out of the 1960s? First, I don't think that all efforts at interfaith dialogue and understanding inevitably lead to the kind of supersessionist story that we see in that last example. There are lots of smart and sincere people involved in interfaith dialogue, and many of them are alert to the ways that shared ritual can too easily slip into cultural appropriation. I do, however, think that ideas are difficult to police or control. Once the idea of Christian Passover seders emerged, people made their own places at the seder table and adopted its rituals as they understood them. Some Christian denominations, aware of the problems of appropriation, have taken care to not explicitly endorse Christian seders, but neither do they expressly forbid them. And because the Seder is conducted in the home without the need for clergy and with its own instruction booklet, they are well suited to being a do-it-yourself do religious ritual, easily adapted and interpreted as desired. And this is part of made, what made researching Christian Seders more challenging than I had expected. Haggadot written by rabbis for use in Christian settings can be seen as attempts to control the ways that Christians understand and engage with the Seder ritual, but they seem to have only had limited success. In a country in which Jews represent perhaps 2% of the total population, there are surely not enough rabbis to effectively lead all Christian celebrations of Passover, and it's hard to claim that most Christians or Jews would want this. In April 2017, Rabbi Zichiel Pukko and David Sandmel published an article entitled, Jesus Didn't Eat a Seder Meal, Why Christians Shouldn't Either in Christianity Today. They argued that Christian seders are ahistorical, as the seder traditions observed today did not exist in the time of Jesus, and like the rabbis who wrote educational guides to Passover for Christian communities in the past, they stressed the importance of the differences between Judaism and Christianity. The critical responses they received asked what authority these men had to police Christian religious practices. Messianic Jews, moreover, asked what right these traditionally Jewish rabbis had to speak for all Jews, or even to define what counted as authentic Jewish religious practice. The challenges presented by Christian Passover seders tell us something about the larger challenges of Jewish-Christian dialogue. Scholar of American religion, K. Helen Gaston, argues that since the 1960s, Americans have often talked about a shared Judeo-Christian heritage, but that they have brought wildly different and even opposing goals to that conversation. 
The example of satyrs helps us appreciate how widely the intentions behind shared ritual and interfaith dialogue can diverge. In the years following the Declaration Nostra Aetate, as well as Protestant statements about Jewish-Christian relations, Jews, it seemed, entered into discussion about the connections between Easter and Passover, primarily in the hope of reducing anti-Semitism experienced by contemporary Jews. And some Christians clearly shared this goal. But many, understandably, prioritized the other component of these statements the desire to engage with the Jewishness of Jesus, rather than with lessons about the history and distinctiveness of a very small group of people that many of them might not really encounter in person. Given these related but different goals, how should we understand the possibilities and limits of modern Jewish-Christian dialogue? What voices are present in the conversations that result? And how should we reckon with the demographic reality that assures that these conversations are always between numerically unequal communities in which Christians represent a large majority and Jews a tiny minority? Christian Passover satyrs, in spite of their origin and new ideas about Jewish-Christian relations, are Christian rituals whose connection to Jews and Jewish practices are somewhat tenuous. And this perhaps helps me understand how I could become a scholar of American Jewish history without knowing anything about them. But I suspect that I should know more. These satyrs help us appreciate something about the ways that Jewish Christian relations have changed and also stayed the same since the theological and scholarly upheavals of the 1960s. And they raise interesting questions about Christian perceptions of Jews in post-war America. And I would argue they allow us to appreciate the dynamic and ever-changing religious ter terrain that Jews navigate within American society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Um, I have a bunch of questions from other, our audiences that I'm going to read. Okay. I also have some questions that I have, uh, but let's start, uh, let's start with the voice of those who listen to us. Uh, so question number one, you can actually um, follow them. There, there was a lot going on in the chat section, yeah. uh, but it will be, if it will be easier for you, you can follow them in the, in the chat section. Okay. So question number one, as a, uh, and it's in the quotation mark, as a ritual for Christians, uh, how does it relate to historical Christian supersessionist appro appropriation and invalidation of Jewish Passover in antiquity? For example, Peri Pascha. Mm -hmm. um, as a ritual for um Well, I mean, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going to answer that fully, but I think that uh, the intentions behind at least some of the origins of the modern, at least American ritual I don't think it starts off as supersessionist, but I, I do think it falls into older patterns of uh, supersessionism of how one interprets the the true meaning of the the holiday. I think that that becomes kind of the the conundrum of uh, this project for uh, shared ritual engagement. Um, I'm scrolling down. Oh, I'm going to find that too distracting. I'm not going to look at the comments. Yes, yes there's a lot <laughs> going on. I told you. <laughs> So um, I think that that was kind of what I found fascinating about it, that you have these very earnest beginnings, uh, certainly in the 50s and then in the early 60s, um, that are designed to uh, sort of fight a supersessionist narrative. And I, I think it's, it becomes hard to um, think oneself out of some of those older models, um, in spite of what I see as you know, some very sincere attempts to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a question with some introduction. Uh, some will call the Christian version of Seder uh, is to further a Christian's education to understand New Testament and Jesus' life, uh, thus co-opting the very Jewish and focused celebration and redirecting the point of what a Seder is to Jewish culture, education, and family continuity. And uh, do they even keep no hamlets during the holiday, just walking through as, and as mentioned, co-opting? I'm reading it as it is. Yeah, I see. Uh, how does one address Passover being called the Jewish Easter, which is confusing for the, for the dialogue? 
I mean, again, I think that becomes one of the really fascinating questions. And, and it was why I was so interested in those recipes. I, I, I like to cook. I read cookbooks for fun. So I thought like, oh, recipes, this will be great. I'll pick up some tips for how to prepare Seder. And it was really fascinating to see where ideas about, um, you know, can you have chametz at your Seder um, emerged in those conversations? And I think the, um, the more that the authors of the Seder and their presumed audiences um, saw the Seder as their own Christian ritual, the less there was um, a perceived obligation to, um, uh, to abide by Jewish dietary restrictions, for example. Um, I think that that's where that supersessionism can be reflected in, in dietary practices, right? If it's the, if the, true meaning of the holiday is um, in this kind of like an imagined experience of Jesus as we see in that uh, cookbook, which was great, uh, super interesting. Um, then you can let your matzo rise because that's how they imagined Jesus would have preferred to eat it. And you don't have to worry about how the Manischewitz company manufactures their matzo. That's, that's, not, that's not what you're interested in. Um, is it co-opting? Yeah, I think there are interesting questions about cultural appropriation um, there that are that are worth wrestling with. I don't think that every form of Christian engagement with Passover is uh, consciously or unconsciously an effort at um, co-opting somebody else's ritual or a cultural appropriation. But I think the slippage um, is becomes pretty clear between uh, between those two things. So it's mm -hmm. complicated. Uh, there is a question that may be uh, difficult, but maybe not. Um, as in the Washington Haggadah, uh, are there any connections uh, to the drawings and the foods that they may eat? I don't know about the Washington Haggadah, so I'm not exactly sure what kind of connection to the drawings and the food that they may eat uh, is mentioned, but that's... Yeah, not, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that one. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, my favorite question, I must admit. How American is this phenomenon? <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I, I started this project uh, assuming that it was a very American phenomenon. It just seemed so much in keeping with um, uh, mid 20th century discourse about Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, uh, tri-faith, America. And that's kind of where I started. My, my first book was on World War I and some of the origins of that uh, tri-faith America discourse. And so I thought like, oh, I'm sure that's where this comes from as well. And so I was super fascinated to learn from you, Malgo, that in fact that this is a profoundly international phenomenon, which, which makes sense, right? If we think of um, Nostra Etate and the statements of uh, the Catholic Church in particular, but also say like the World Lutheran Federation as being um, the actual starting points of some of this idea of shared ritual, then um, I think it has to have an international component as well. Um, I, it would be fascinating to see how uh, that discourse plays out in different national contexts. Um, in the United States, I think it does get folded in, or at least some, some models of Seder get folded into this attempt to uh, think of the United States as a country of three faiths, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, that uh, becomes a sort of part of popular discourse in the United States in the 1950s. Um, I'm less sure about the timing in other parts of the world, as in Poland, um, but it would be super interesting to, to know more comparatively. How does it play out? So since we are uh, on this topic, uh, that's sort of a question I wanted to, uh, to ask you because our initial conversations were about the publicly performed or publicly celebrated uh, Jewish Christian setters yeah. uh, in American context. Um, can you comment a little bit on that? To, to what extent um, your two arguments, or even more of them, are at play in these public setters? The most obvious, probably to many of us, would be the, the setter at the, um, at the White House, but mm -hmm. also others from the 60s uh, on. I know that you were studying them in our collections. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent they're different, to what extent they're connected, uh, to the 
more family uh, family oriented celebrations that you decided to focus on so it's interesting so i i had um while i was looking through the collections at the center for jewish history i was going through the freedom seder collection uh in the uh, rabbi arthur waskow very famously led a, a freedom seder a third seder um uh, uh, it's part of a, a tradition that emerges of having these third night satyrs that are focused on uh, very often social issues. So you see socialist third night satyrs, you see uh, feminist satyrs that are held. Um, and Wasco uh, originates this freedom satyr, which was um, certainly conceived of as being open to interfaith celebration and participation very, very consciously. Um, but was what was interesting, contrasting that to some of the Christian Haggadot I was looking at, um, was that Waskow's Seder is interested in, um, in some ways it, it falls much more into that educational Haggadah model where it's looking to use the form of the Seder in order to uh, struggle against sources of oppression in American society. So anti-Semitism among a larger array of, of social ills that he is gonna use the, the format of the state or to struggle with. Um, but it's, it's not interested in the sort of Christian theological debates that you see um, in the uh, Christian Haggadot I was looking at. And I was surprised by that contrast. Um, I had the opportunity to go out to the University of uh, Colorado, Boulder, and to look through some of their collections on uh, post-Holocaust Judaism. And they have a lot of material uh, dealing with contemporary Haggadot. And uh, when I had gone out there, I was drawn, they had all this stuff on you know, interfaith celebrations. And I was like, great, this will be a, a rich pool of expressions of interfaith celebration. And everything that was labeled interfaith was in fact about Jewish interfaith families. Um, and interesting sort of ways of expanding the Jewish ritual to include interfaith families and uh, feminist reinterpretations of the Seder in order to make the ritual more inclusive. Um, none of them uh, were interested in engaging with the Christian theological uh, questions that you see emerging in these other Haggadot. And, and that contrast, I think, is, is worth thinking about as well. The Jewish celebrations of the uh, Passover and of the Seder have changed tremendously, both over the span of history, um, and I think uh, at perhaps an accelerated pace in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Um, but they're interested in different questions than these Christian celebrations are. Um, to your point about public versus private, I had kind of anticipated that I would be able to go to some of the Christian denominational websites and publications and find official proclamations about, well, how do you do this and what does it mean? Um, and that was one of the real challenges of the research. I, I found a, a much more silence on that topic than would have I would have expected. Um, uh, I, I, the, the, I quoted from a Presbyterian Haggadah that was quite supersessionist in its intentions um, and was really fascinated that the Presbyterian Church is one of them that says, oh, no, no, we, you know, we don't take any official stand on uh, Passover celebrations. But if you want to celebrate it, here's a library of resources that you can draw from to do it on your own. So I have a feeling that um, there is a distinction between sort of uh, broadly public celebrations uh, endorsed by a denomination of which I, I don't think there are that many within some of the more traditional Christian denominations and these kind of semi-private celebrations that are meant to be held either in your home or within a particular church community um, without necessarily the condemnation of a church body but not necessarily the full-throated support either. I would love to hear more about this denominational differences between Christianity, within Christianity, yeah. but let's give the voice to our audiences. Uh, okay. There's one technical question. Can we have the information about the ADL Haggadot again? Would you mind? It's, uh, it's called simply a Passover Haggadah. It was published in 1954, and it is in the collections of the American Jewish Historical Society. Mm -hmm. At the Center for Jewish History. At the Center for Jewish History. 
Uh, another question: How much of a relationship to Christian satyrs have? Uh, how much of a relationship do Christian satyrs have with other Judaizing tendencies in some American Christian circles, like messianistic synagogues, etc.? Mm. So um, I had tried to bracket off um, messianic Jewish communities when I started this. I thought I would look more at um, sort of mainline Christian denominate, Protestant Christian denominations and at uh, the Catholic Church. Um, uh, the, the minister that I sort of started my paper with comes from a, he is a very mainline Lutheran congregation. Um, and so I thought, well, that that's interesting to me because these are, um, I, I don't know, looking at the historical change over time. And I thought that messianic communities would perhaps have a, a different agenda. And um, I found it was harder to separate those communities than I had realized, um, in part because I think of that kind of do-it-yourself nature of the, the ritual. Um, so back to my example of the Presbyterian Church, um, which does not take an official position endorsing this practice, but will make recommendations, you know, where you can buy books to do it yourself. And they would include books on their list or that you can buy through their bookstore um, that were clearly messianic publications. And I wasn't really sure how to how to read that, whether that was um, just the chance of, you know, people putting titles up on a website or whether that was intentional. Um, certainly messianic communities uh, feel that they have a significant investment in um, not just the celebration of Passover, but in um, uh, uh, having recognition of the authenticity of their um, experience of and practice of Passover rituals that are very focused on the J Jewishness of Jesus. Like, for example, the Parmigiano. <laughs> yes. Um, have you encountered any resistance among Christians to stressing Jesus's Jewishness? Have I encountered? Um, I have not. Um, but, you know, to be fair, I've been reading literature, not talking to, uh, not going sort of door to door asking people about it. So I think that... Um, uh, there is a there's a boom in literature uh, in the late 20th century about uh, the Jewish origins of Christianity and the Jewish Ju Jesus's Jewish identity. There's there's a, a list of books that I, I will never get through on that topic. So in terms of scholarly debate, I think it became a very powerful uh, um sort of like richly suggestive idea for uh, both theological discussion and historical discussion and um, religious discussion. Um, uh, are there people who reject it? I mean, yeah, sure, people, people think all kinds of things, but I haven't personally seen that yet. Mm -hmm. I would assume that this is also connecting to the Haggadot. So do, do, the way I understand this question is, do, have you seen any uh, resistance in underlining the Jewishness of Jesus, in kind of abstracting Jesus oh. from his Jewishness in the Haggadot. In the Haggadot themselves? No, there I saw very much the opposite, that the reason to uh, observe the Seder, the reason to engage with the Passover ritual is the Jewishness of Jesus, that that becomes the sort of justification for why this is a Christian ritual. Um, so there I don't see it at all. Mm -hmm. um, it is new to me to consider these cultural rituals in the uh, in this way. So and so, I am only hearing arguments uh, for antagonism between the two systems of belief. Are the uh, are there aspects of both that actually connect? Um, so, as I mentioned, sort of in passing in the talk, there is a, a really long and rich uh, body of literature looking at the historical origins of the two holidays and of these two religious communities. So um, is there reason to, to look for the connections? Historically, absolutely there is. And there's tremendous, like I said, body of scholarship on it. Um, uh, I think I'm more fascinated by these contemporary manifestations than by the, the ancient connections. 
not that they are uninteresting, but it, it was a sort of daunting task to, to look at how much has been published on that. But I, I think for somebody who's interested, um, by all means, there's, there's fantastic scholarship that looks at um, really, you know, deep uh, connections between the origins of the two holidays and the origins of the rituals uh, that are used to, to mark the two holidays. Uh -huh. Did you ask rabbis wh why they would or would not lead these interfaith setters? What were the responses? Um, so the, the rabbis I cited at the beginning were kind of typical. Uh, there were rabbis who said they would be involved with, they wouldn't necessarily lead interfaith satyrs, although some, some would. Uh, some said they would be involved with them in some way, uh, really almost universally uh, as a strategy to fight anti-Semitism. Um, and then the rabbis who uh, said they would not, um, uh, tended to be more conservative on the sort of Jewish religious spectrum and felt that that was just not their place as a rabbi, that participating in any way or being seen as condoning a Christian ritual was not in keeping with how they understood their rabbinic role. Mm -hmm. uh, how about non-denominational churches? I don't know enough about them yet. I suspect that uh, there is widespread practice of Passover within non-denominational churches. Um, I don't have a, a definitive answer on that one. I'll check back with me. <laughs> I love work in progress for that. <laughs> uh, do movies like Ten Commandments or King of Kings that refer to satyrs and Passover mm -hmm. shape this topic in Christians' minds and Jews too? That's a great question and one I really hadn't thought of. Thank you, question asker. I, I really appreciate that one. Actually, I've, I've been so focused on reading Haggadot. Um, I hadn't thought about, yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet yes. Um, and that would be super interesting to see changing depictions of uh, the life of Christ and engagement with Passover Seder in, in movies and other forms of po popular media. That's, that, thank you. Of course, uh, I immediately raised uh, by uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, started thinking about the scenes from Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm sure that's like, you know, the topic for another project. Yeah, that'd be um, Messianistic groups, uh, oh, that's not a question. Mm, are there any paragraphs that are omitted in Haggadahs published for Christians? Uh, yes, M most particularly uh, the paragraphs at the end, uh, uh, towards the end of the Seder that call for, you know, Shvokha Matcha, right, like the destruction of the enemies of the house of Jacob. Those are, are, are almost universally taken out. Um, uh, I only saw them referenced in one Haggadah um, where it was sort of at the introduction talked about like the Jews used to say this and who could blame them because of centuries of anti-Semitism, but now we do not say them anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Seder as a whole, the liturgy, uh, does not conform to a, a traditional Orthodox text. It, uh, the most commonly used, um, English translation was the Union Haggadah of the Reform Movement was often the, the base text for some of these Haggadot, um, but people kind of mix and match as they want. Um, and definitely anything within the text that uh, called for the er eradication of the, the enemies of the Jews uh, is, is taken out. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, also, um, the, just to interrupt you, sorry. Uh, sometimes also the phrase uh, next year in Jerusalem is also taken out. And I think uh, depending on how people want to gloss what that means, uh, you know, sometimes it is next year, sometimes it was very explicitly next year in Jerusalem uh, with the Messianic return of Christ, and sometimes it's just not, not present there. I think it didn't fit sufficiently with the, the narrative of the text. Mm -hmm. Um, I am going to read two comments because they, uh, now they sort of started to create a, a threat of its own. Uh, and I must, uh, shout out, they are both by Nancy Sinkov. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> which will provide some context. Uh, so, uh, f she commented a while ago that try faith. So the, the, this idea of, of, America uh, of three faiths is part of Cold War liberalism, the American fight against godless totalitarianism. And um, she has just commented again, um, 
in the context of, of popular culture. That's Cecil DeMille's acceptance speech at Academy Awards for Ten Commandments emphasizes his Cold War anti-communism liberal, liberalism. So it's mm -hmm. interesting. It's an interesting thread that I thought it's not a question but a comment. But I thought I would add it. Um, no, I think that's really useful. Um, I cited a couple of times a uh, Kay Helen Gaston's book, uh, which is out just this year, and um, makes the interesting argument that it's not just anti-communism, that, that, that it's a sort of broader, that tri-faith America, the idea of Judeo-Christian America, is part of a sort of broader struggle against uh, what is seen as the forces of secularism. Um, so communism as part of yeah. that. Um, but certainly I think that Cold War uh, motif is really important. And, and thank you for the reference to, uh, to Cecil B. DeMille. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, the, what's the significance that in French, PAC uh, is uh, both Easter and Passover, but Passover takes the lowercase p. Also, according to my mother, much the same phenomenon in Polish. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to argue with anyone's mother. Uh, yes, indeed, the word Pascha uh, is the same. It used to be used in Polish, just like uh, it can be used as a as a synonym, uh, synonym, synonymous. Uh, except that uh, this is an, an old Polish, so nobody would say it's. Uh, now it would be Easter. Um, so that's the Polish part. But the question is, what's the significance, according to you, that in French, the same word means both, uh, both holidays? I, I think it goes back to the ancient connections between the two holidays. And that linguistic connection, I think, is there in a number of languages. Um, um, and it is clear that there are sort of shared roots of the two holidays, and that is reflected often uh, linguistically, um, but again, I, I'm going to say I'm, I, I, I profess no expertise in ancient Judaism or Christianity, um, uh, but I think we have those linguistic traces that do tell us about that, that prior history, and there's, uh, like I said, a whole library of stuff to read about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we uh, have no more questions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this was a truly uh, fascinating uh, talk and what is best about it is that because it's a uh, work in progress uh, it means that we are going to hopefully be able to uh, to invite you again and you are going to tell us more about what uh, what your your findings were I can see that there is one more question it never ends that's a good news uh, have you studied setters in black churches um, you know, interestingly, I haven't yet, although I think that that has to be one of the next steps in the research. Um, uh, certainly that motif of the, the Exodus narrative is so important within African American Christianity. Um, and in some of those uh, third night satyrs, Arthur Waskow's Freedom Seder, um, the idea of uh, which, which parallel the civil rights movement, right? The idea of racial oppression um, and breaking free from racial oppression is, is so important to Jewish engagement with uh, new interpretations of the Seder. So um, I, I do, again, I don't have an answer for you. It is a work in progress, but I, I think that's a, an important direction to head. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all uh, to, to the audience for joining us. Uh, if you enjoyed the program, which looks like you have, uh, we hope that you might consider making a donation. Uh, there is a link that I posted on the, on the, in the chat uh, window. Uh, your donations allow us to put on programs like this one while the center is closed. So thank you very much for your generosity. Uh, as I mentioned before, this program is uh, recorded. So within a week or so, uh, it's going to be available via YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, so please don't be shy, share it with, uh, share the link with others. Uh, thank you again, Jessica. We're looking forward to, uh, to the next chapter of this work in progress. And thank you very much for being such a wonderful and, and engaged um, fellow over this past year at the oh. Center for Jewish History. Thank you. Thank you really very much to the Center for Jewish History and to Fordham University. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. You too.